Now, when they're off the bottom, that's where it gets tricky. Yep. Or when they just won't bite, you know. I'm gonna tell you right now, I, it's hard to catch these fish. I, I'll, I'll speak for 90% of the guides on the lake. They're not catching most of the fish they're seeing. Most of the time when these guys are out here and they're seeing groups of fish out here at Lake Fork right now, they're not catching them. And it's not, I don't think it's just Lake Fork either. I think East Texas has had, set, had such crazy weather, our fish are all scattered. The, the very end of the lake and the, the very top of the lake and the very bottom of the lake are the same water temperature. Um, it's 47 degrees every third night. So the fish are kind of off, so they're a little bit trickier to catch. And when you start seeing them off the bottom, that's when you got a few other options that are that maybe aren't as popular as a Carolina rig or a big crankbait. Yeah. One's gonna be a flutter spoon. Um, and I think a flutter spoon is one of the best way to target these big fish, especially on the bald spots. I'll, you can throw it in timber um, or, or some stuff. You just gotta be real careful on your count now to make sure you're not hitting bottom and snagging bottom every time. But when I'm starting to see those fish off the bottom, a lot of people will, and I hear this most of the time. In fact, this is probably nine, nine out of 10 folks who get in my boat and we see these fish if this is the bottom, these fish are plastered like this. The first thing that comes to their mind is, oh, we need to get a crankbait down there. Well, the problem is the crankbait's going all the way. If you're doing it right, the crankbait's going all the way to the bottom. Now, it'll it'll get them to fire up. I mean, they can hear it, see it, feel it. Everything it will else. draw them down sometimes. It will get them to fire up. That's not necessarily the best option. You know, there's these fish might be seven, eight, ten foot apart. You know, um, a flutter spoon's a great one. Um, and then I'll tell you another one is just a swim bait. Just a swim bait. And yeah, absolutely. This is the swim bait on either an underspin head, depending on your wind and your depth and all that. If you can keep the underspin down enough, the underspin's good. Uh, but yeah, a swim bait on jig head's a great option. And then, I mean, for me, it depends on how far they're suspended off the bottom. So if they're suspended, I don't mean suspended. I shouldn't say suspended. I mean staggered off the bottom, like an active school. Yeah, it's just kind of going crazy. But they're just like three yeah. to five feet off the bottom. Yeah. So one other uh, another thing that I'll do is I'll actually take a. Uh, a Carolina rig and get myself a big like five or six foot leader throw that Carolina rig out there and then snap it and when I snap that Carolina rig it makes that bait do this a few feet off the bottom and kind of as long as they're still relatively close to the bottom they're not you know more than five feet of, off the yeah. bottom if they're six seven eight nine ten feet off the bottom then that Carolina rig deal is not really going to be the deal but if they're a few feet off the bottom you can snap that Carolina rig get you a big long five foot leader something like that I know that sounds crazy and it's kind of a pain to throw but it's really effective it's basically like taking uh, a wacky worm or a Senko yeah. or something you throw up right. shallow and get a weightless plastic presentation into that, and it gets right up in their face and it just kind of dies down and yeah. That's uh, good it, stuff. it can work really yeah. good. You know, another one I'll throw uh, is a hair jig. Hair jig is um, great. Golly, yeah. A hair jig. I forgot all about that. That's a great bait. Or a... Uh, hey, buddy. Oh, thank you. Got some graph images here. Sweet. Let me pass them. So let's so staggered fish off the bottom. I'm gonna pass these around. Uh, here, let me have them off the camera. I'll show them to the camera and then pass them around. Okay. You just keep talking. So here, here, those, those, those are staggered. Those are kind of staggered off the bottom. That's not a great. I wish I'd have got an image of the one school I pulled up on yesterday, but I got two and I caught them all. And my nephew had to watch. Hope he watches this. Um, so on the flutter spoon, all all I'm doing, I'm throwing a big flutter spoon. I think it's like a five inch. I'll make a really long cast past the target and I'll completely slack line. And I mean completely slack line. And I'm not talking, I don't, I don't, it's the right way to let line off your rod is not to let it just unwind on the spool. I see people doing that all the time. They get backlashes or if they get bit right then, then they're in trouble. The best way to do it is fire the out there. backlash? Huh? <laughs> the old bite oh, yeah. backlash? <laughs> pull that line off, watch it fall, pull some more line off if you need. Keep a really good bow in your line and watch that line. You have to watch the line on a flutter spoon when you're fishing deep. They're going to bite it when it's falling. They're not going to bite it when you rip it up. If you rip it up and you hit them, you probably snag them. They're going to bite it when it's falling. So I'll, I'll take it, I'll let it hit. As soon as that bow stops, I'm seeing that line go. The second it stops, I'm going to spin my handle as fast as I can. I'm going to grab the bottom of my rod, I'm going to rip it up as hard as I can over my shoulder with no slack. I want a straight pull. And then I'm going to drop that rod tip and let that slack get back in my, that bow get back in my line. Let it fall to the bottom. The second, I mean the very second, that that line stops, I'm going to spin the handle and go straight back up. Okay. All I'm trying to do is pull that spoon as far off the bottom as I can, as fast as I can, and let it flutter. And that's where I'm going to feel the bite. I'm going to watch that line, but I'm going to feel it. I'm going to, I'm going to anticipate that bite. When they bite that flutter spoon, all I'm going to do is engage my reel and pull up. Same, I do this pretty much the same thing on a hair jig. I'll take a hair jig and I'll snap it twice and let it fall on slack line. The same thing. They're going to come up and they're going 
hit that hair jig. They're going to come under the hair jig and they're going to hit it. And you're going to feel a tap and you're going to have slack in your line. You just reel down and you get them. I'm, I'm, throw, I'm throwing a 7.6 heavy for both of those on 20 pound line. I do a flare spin different. I do, I do a flare spin. You do spin. reel and kill? No, I do the action the same. Uh, pretty pretty much the same as best I can. But I throw it on a, I throw it on a, uh, a really, <laughs> it's funny we're saying this. I throw the flare spin on a much lighter setup than you're throwing it on. Gotcha. And the only reason that I do, I used to throw the flutter spoon on a heavy rod because the flutter spoon's awkward to cast. It's really heavy. It catches wind like crazy. It's a pain to cast. It really is. Um, but man, I, you know, do you, you you lose fish on a flutter spoon? Who saw the the Gunnersville tournament with Chris Zaldane? Well, that poor guy. I don't know how many he lost. That he could have maybe won that tournament with in that deal. But you lose fish on a flutter spoon, and I was. Lucky enough to be friends with Joe Spates, who's the man that invented the flutter spoon, uh, who's from right here on Lake Fort. Um, and I was, you know, him being the guy that invented it and the guy I got all my flutter spoon from, I was basically pissing and moaning about losing all these fish. You know, I was trying to figure out how to catch flutter spoon fish, and every these time are, I hooked one. These are fish that are really tapered to the bottom. Of yeah, the these there's a lot now. Some great images yeah. here. Uh, but he told me, he goes, well, you know, you're just <coughs> trying to fish it like you fish everything. You're trying to set the hook hard, and you're trying to, you know, reel them to the top and boat flip them, and you got that thing on too big a rod. And he said, and I got a bad habit of trying to reel them to the top too fast and boat flip them. I, I'm bad about that. He said, if you'll get yourself a medium action rod and throw it on a lighter line, it will for you won't have you won't have the power to pull them up, and it'll force you to start taking your time with that fish. And when you do that, and you let that fish take its time, and you don't bring it up to the top, you won't lose near as many. And it was, it took me a little while to get in the habit of not pulling, still pulling them. I would still, even with a lighter rod, but still pull them. But once I got in the habit of not pulling that fish to the top, so basically I'm doing the action the same. Rip it up, follow it down, watch the slack fall. Rip it up, follow it down, watch the, if it. If it jumps, reel down, and I'll just reel into them and pull. And then once I've pulled that rod and bowed that rod up real good, I'll kind of let off them a little bit. And I've got a really whippy rod that's going to stay bent. And as long as that rod stays bent, I'm not pulling on that fish at all. And I'm going to try to let them swim as much down deep as they will and not let them come up. Like, I don't want to pull them at all. And what will happen is a lot of the time, you know, every once in a while you'll get one that will just start swimming to the top. When that happens, you better point it. Like, if he's swimming up over there, you better point the rod down in this way and start reeling as fast as you can. But a lot of times these fish won't come up if you don't pull them up. We, we cause these fish to come up and jump a lot of the time by pulling on them with these bigger rods that we use. And that fish will stay down there and swim if you don't pull him. And he'll literally get so tired that by the time he comes up, she just kind of rolls over on the side on the surface and you scoop her up in the net. Or, you know, reach out there and lip her because uh, you ain't boat flipping her. So the rod that I throw on is actually kind of a one-off rod. I don't have any, it's one flutter spoon rod in my boat. It's a 710 medium action. It feels like a crappie rod. It sucks trying to cast that flutter spoon with it. You got to really take your time, load it up, and lob it. But man, I, d I just don't lose flutter spoon fish anymore now. Like, that sounds it's, terrible. It's it, no, I don't that lose sounds any. Sounds terrible. I don't lose any flutter spoon fish anymore. You know, like I, I couldn't tell you the last time I had a flutter spoon fish come off. It just I land them all now. So um, yeah, flutter spoon. And the guy that invented the technique told me to do it that way, so I kind of was like, yeah, maybe I should listen. Uh, you know? um, but yeah, no, flutter spoon, and then uh, the hair jig. I'm throwing the hair jig on the same rod as well. Um, uh, kind of the, the only other thing that I'm really, if I can't get these fish that are off the bottom and kind of going crazy, if I can't get them to bite anything that I'm throwing, and I have to, I'll throw an Alabama rig down there. I hate yeah. to throw an Alabama rig. I was gonna say, um, Alabama rig, you know, if you got fish that are up off the bottom, that's a good bait, yeah. you know, that is a good bait. Let me ask you this, now this time of year, when we're talking about the fish that we're trying to target, we know they're not eating threadfin shad. Now in the winter time, we'll throw Alabama rigs with swim baits this big on it. Little three inch swim baits. I'm throwing on the same. I'm throwing you, the same. You not upsize it. your swim baits because no. they're eating bigger bait fish. No. And you're trying to target. I don't. I don't look at Alabama rig that way. Okay. I look at Alabama rig as a great opportunity for them to get just whatever is right there. Yeah. You know, kind of the same thing with my underspin. I'm throwing a four. I mean, I don't change the swim baits either. I was just curious. Yeah, I throw a 4.4 inch uh, divine um, on the underspin on these deep fish. But then when I'm throwing a jig head, I'm usually throwing a bigger swim bait, you know. Uh, but I, that's sort of my finesse presentation, I guess. Same with the Alabama rig. I'm not really running into these deep fish with an Alabama rig at first. 
and, and you know, and I think there's clearer lakes that that's a that's a more effective tactic early on in the in the battle. But um, well, I think too when fish to spend more than a few like. When you yes. really got suspended, suspended fish, fish yes. an Alabama rig is an That's absolute a, yes, player. Yes. And we're not I'm not I'm not talking about fish that are sitting in the middle of the water column. I'm talking about fish that are just like you drive by and you're like, man, what are they doing? Like they're getting, you know, they're just not all hunkered down to the bottom. Um, they're kind of active. Mm, Absolutely. Yeah, um, now one thing I want to talk about, and it's just kind of ironic, we just did the flutter spoon deal that we do completely different was um, you know, we, we said something earlier about confidence and what, you know, doing what you're comfortable with and, you know, that's a beautiful part about fishing is we all do it differently uh, on certain things. There's certain little things that every one of us does, especially all of us that fish as much as we do. There's certain little things that every one of us does that we don't necessarily always talk about, but and it may be something very minute but we feel like it gives us an advantage, helps us catch more fish, land more fish, get more bites, whatever the case may be. Uh, there's different things that we do differently. And I by no means am trying to say that I'm right in this situation because you've thrown a deep crankbait a lot more than I have and have caught a lot more fish on it than I have. But we go about deep cranking on totally opposite ends of the spectrum as far as our gear and kind of how we, once we get a bite, how we deal with those fish but that's based on our gear. So let's talk about that. So I'll tell you kind of my progression. So I, early on, I would crank with graphite. And, and there are people that crank, not many, not many full-time anglers crank with graphite. Just not gonna see a lot. You do see a significant amount though um, that crank with graphite. What you, what, the only thing that you really lose with composite or fiberglass is sensitivity. You gain parabolic bend, but you do lose sensitivity maybe a significant amount. But with, with fluorocarbon, it kind of helps a little bit. We still do lose some sensitivity. I used to crank with uh, graphite rods. I would throw like a 7.6, medium heavy or heavy or something like that, you know, early on in the deal. I stopped because um, I started losing, I didn't start losing fish, but I've lost big fish and I've had customers and I still lose big fish. Anybody says they don't lose big fish on a crankbait is just lying to you. You're gonna lose, but the best crankers in the world are gonna lose big fish in a crankbait. It's a lot of weight with treble hooks, and it's moving real, real, real fast when they attack it. The difference in that and a flutter spoon, flutter spoon's just kind of falling, and they're coming up and getting it. You know, you, 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 can, you can use a medium rod, or you can use a heavy rod, or whatever you wanna do on that deal. A crankbait, a lot of times it's moving so fast, they might barely get a hook in their lip. And so for me, um, what I did is I switched to a composite rod. And the only reason I switched to a composite rod, I lost sensitivity. No doubt I lost sensitivity. 100%. I'm cranking a hard spot, and I can't really feel the difference as well early on. I can now because I throw it so much. Mm -hmm. Early on in the move into a composite rod, I couldn't feel it quite as well. And I've thrown fiberglass rods back in the day. I just couldn't handle just a straight fiberglass rod. Um, but I throw, I throw like on a, like on a uh, C15 or a C20, I'm throwing like a, mid seven foot medium heavy action rod with a lot of bend in it. You know, stout rod, it's got a it's got a stopping point, but it's got a lot of give. 15 pound fluorocarbon, six speed reel. Um, but when I go up to like the C20, C25, now I'm going up to like a, a 710 or a 711. I got a 710, I got a 711 um, heavy action rods. Now the difference that we're gonna talk about mm -hmm. is my heavy action has got a lot of parabolic bend. Yeah. It's got a whole lot of bend. A lot of tip. A lot of tip. The reason I throw that and I'm gonna give you a quick story and you're gonna like this. I'm sitting in Falcon with some buddies one time. I'm on a guide trip and I've caught, I, I've lost count how many fish I've caught at Lake Falcon on big crankbait. So many big fish, me and my customers. I'm cranking, a, I'm cranking a deep spot on the side of the river and I hit this fish and it's, I mean, it's like, she bites the crankbait and now we're ripping drag instantly, right? Now this is a long cast, I'm throwing as far as I can. And instantly, as soon as that fish bites, I'm ripping drag. And I'm standing on the front deck with my rod up, just doing what I always do, just bringing this fish in the boat. Well, this fish comes up and jumps, can't get her belly out of the water. She's so big, her mouth shoots, crankbait comes flying. And I'm just distraught. I can't believe I lost this, lost this big old fish. No big deal, I throw back out there, same thing. Bam, I hit, instantly, instantly drag. This first fish is probably 12 or 13 pounds, I don't know, it's way out there. The second fish, as soon as I hit the rock, bam, loads up, starts ripping drag, shaking the head starts coming up, shaking the head. I'm doing the same thing. I'm standing on my deck. Hey guys, 
You know, if anybody's fishing with me, that's why I like, hey, watch, here she comes. We're about to see her jump. Watch her, watch for her. She comes up, boom, like a, like a marlin, throws my dang crank back. And I'm like, God, dog. And I told him, I said, if I get another one, and this is a 10, 11 pound fish. This is two casts. I said, if I get another one, I'm freaking babying this deal. Same thing he said on the spoon. I fire out there, get down, hit the rock, bam, 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 instantly. Starts ripping drag. And here's three casts. I got another fish. I landed this one. I got down on my knees and put my rod in the water. Now, I've seen this before. I've watched pros do this. They get down on their knees and they'll get it. I've been in the boat with these guys, Kelly Jordan one time, and he, he's, he's so adamant about keeping this fish down that he's, mm -hmm. he's, he's down like this. And um, that's how I look like an idiot. You know, I'm down there with my, my rod in the water, but I'm so concerned about, I don't know how big this fish is because I ain't letting her jump. And that fish came to the boat. Now, before that, I've caught hundreds. I mean, hundreds of fish in crankbait. Probably 20 fish over 10 fish. I don't even know how many double-digit fish I've caught on a big crankbait. And I'm, I'm getting whooped. And I realized the problem is I'm not taking every fish. I'm not, I'm not, what am I trying to say? I don't care about these fish enough. Does that make sense? We don't, we catch so You're many. You're not giving it the respect it I'm deserves. I'm not giving these fish the respect <laughs> they deserve. It's kind of like he's talking about on a spoon. And that's what you got to, that's what, I, that's how I handle the situation. Because what he's going to talk about is more of a Rick Clun approach. That's, by the way, that's a Rick, what I call the, the Rick Clun approach. He's got the same approach, which is heavy rod, get him in. Um, yeah. And I'm, I will, we'll say I'm more of the KVD, uh, keep combs, keep them suckers in the water and uh, keep that head down. And, I, and I've got a lot of bend in my rod. And uh, especially for me mentally, especially with these heavy crankbaits, three quarter ounce crankbaits, you know, and if they got one hook, well, that's C25 like is 1.9 ounces. Yeah. So now, so now we got a two ounce crankbait and maybe one little hook on the back. And we got a 10 pounder that I can't really do nothing with with 15 pound line. I mean, yeah. just not a lot, especially in May when they but, got all I mean, that's things. the two schools of thought. You've got the 15 pound line, all the parabolic bend, all the shock absorption and stretch, and, and no matter how hard that fish shakes, your rod's still gonna stay tight because right. you got so much bend in the rod. And then I, you gotta get down. You gotta, you gotta get, get down. down. That's one thing we do have in common. So the way that I do it, now, one thing that's different is, it, like I said, again, not saying that I'm right because this guy's got a lot more time on a crankbait than I do on deep crankbait. And I shouldn't, this will, this will prove to you guys that we tell you the truth about what we use and how we use it because I'm six cents through and through. Everybody knows that about me. I'm a hardcore six cents guy. Love that company. Believe in everything they make and everything they do. I shouldn't say this out loud on camera and all that. I don't even know that I own C-15s. I don't know <laughs> that I do. Like, I, I'm sure I got some. But I don't ever really use them. I go with a C20 and a C25, and I, I like even if I'm fishing 12 foot of water, I'm fine with that C20 just digging, digging, digging. Like that's how I like to fish a crankbait. I want it to dig. I want it to bounce as hard as it can off the bottom. That's my belief system. I'm trying to get that crankbait to bounce as violently as it can off whatever it can to get deflections and get big reaction bites. So I'm only using C20 and C25s 99% of the time. I'm throwing it on a 7, 8 uh, heavy rod. I used to throw it on an 8 foot heavy uh, that had a little bit more tip, but I like this one even better. I've got a 7, 8 heavy rod, and, and the tip is not limber. Like, this is the same rod that I would throw a big swim bait on. Same rod I'd throw a convict on or something like, you know, a big 7 inch, 8 yeah. inch, big soft plastic swim bait with a 10 odd hook that I got to drive on. Same rod. Um, that's the rod I'm throwing it on. And the other thing that I do. <laughs> It's wrong. <laughs> is I throw it on a eight to one gear ratio Super Duty reel, a big deep spool eight to one loose Super Duty is what I'm throwing my deep crank baits on. Uh, I can throw that bait out there. A I can make that Super Duty cast a mile. I can throw that bait forever long, uh, and, and with that stiff rod too, I can still throw it forever long. But I stick my rod down. As soon as I throw the bait out, I stick my rod down, and I go, and then I go like this. So I make like three hard cranks and I just go, and that baits, by the time I've made three cranks with an eight to one, it's most of the way down there. Uh, it's about, it's getting close to bottoming out after three hard cranks. And I get it down there and now I really can go slow and with that graphite rod that is stiff, okay, that is a <laughs> stiff rod and me being able to not sit here and do this, but do this and my bait's still moving fast. My bait's still going to, I can feel every single bump to me. I want all that feel. That's one of the things that I do want. And, and I can, when I'm reeling slow, but my bait's moving fast, I can feel that bait going tum, 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 tum. And anytime it hits something extremely hard or it goes over something, 
I can feel it. And sometimes I'll mix in a pause or whatever. I just feel like I have more control over the bait. I can feel it better. I can impart a better action on the bait on this setup using an eight to one gear ratio reel and just winding it real slow but the bait's still moving fast and I got all that sensitivity. Now, it's a lot like I, I do with a chatterbait. If you're gonna fish chatterbait the way I fish chatterbait, which is on heavier line and heavier rod, then you can't set the hook. You can't, you can't set the hook and catch the fish the same way that you do on the other setup that most people throw a chatterbait on. Same thing with crankbait. Uh, you know, one good thing is all I gotta do is as I'm doing this, my hook set. That's all the pull I need to set a hook, even with a bunch of line out. So I got this big heavy action rod. So I don't have to set the hook real hard. I don't have to pull way around behind me. I'll just be sitting there reeling and pull like that, and I got him. And now I got him, my rod tip's already down, and my first move is this. One thing about a C20 and a C25, it's got really big treble hooks on it. And yeah, they may only have one, but that one's pretty dang stout. If they got one bend of a C25, that's a pretty stout, heavy gauge piece of hook right there in their mouth. Uh, the disadvantage is if they barely got that hook where it's kind of skin hook, you can have some problems. You, you can't, I will admit that, you can't have some problems when that happens. <laughs> but I go like this, I'll pull into them, I'm already down, and I do exactly what you said. This is a similarity. I drop to my knee, I stick that rod as far as I can in the water, and I just start going like this. I mean, I just reel it as fast as I can. Just, I'm not gonna let that fish jump. If that fish gets its mouth to the surface, all it's gonna do is go, and just swallow water the whole way to the boat. And I'm gonna put that rod down as far as I can and horse it as hard as I can, and when it gets in range, I'm boat flipping it. And if it comes off, it comes off. But, you know, do I lose some fish cranking? Yeah, everybody loses fish cranking, like you said. But I don't lose very many. I don't lose very many. And I catch some really big fish deep cranking. Um, and just with that rod and that reel and being able to catch up to them and keep up to them so quick, I can kind of keep them down really fast to the boat and just swing them in. And if, so if I have a partner that happens to have a net there, we just reel them straight into the net. But if I'm by myself or whatever, there's not a net there, I just flop them on in. How many hours can you sustain this? <laughs> it's, I'm telling you, that's the misconception though. Because it's three hard cranks, and then you're just, man, you're, you're cattle, I can do. Oh, well, you're still pulling that sucker. Ooh, I'm no, getting, but with, I'm getting the, cramps, but with that heavier getting, rod, it doesn't pull on you. cranking up? To me, up. so to me, it's easier for me to crank that crankbait on that bigger rod than it is on a rod right. that's got tip. And yeah, I've got an eight to one, but dude, I'm winding slow, and there's almost no bend in my rod when I'm cranking that thing. Yeah. It is staying on bottom and bouncing and doing its thing like we want it to do. Sure. And there's really not much, not as much resistance on it because that rod's holding up to it, and I'm just winding that reel real slow. I'm not gotcha. putting a lot of pressure on my hand either way. So um, you have to throw it sometime and just see what I'm talking about because I know it's it's completely opposite of what everybody thinks, but I found the number one reason I started throwing it on that was one day I didn't have my crankbait rod in the boat and I wanted to crank, so I, what's the only big rod I got to throw crankbait on was a big heavy one, and I threw it down there and I was like, man, that's really easy. Like, that's coming through there. So that's how that deal started with me, and then I just started horsing the boat and I ain't really looked back. Nice, nice. I don't really so put a lot of thought into everything I do, though. So that's I, <laughs> <laughs> if you're tournament fishing, However, you need to put a lot of thought into everything. You do. <laughs> well, that's good stuff, man. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, it, you know, and that's the deal. For me, I feel like I have an advantage on uh, having more sensitivity and more power over a bigger fish when I get a hold of him. And for you, you you have more confidence and feel like you have an advantage by being able to keep that fish hooked up on your setup. Yeah, and, and you feel better about it that way. So. You know, two opposite ways of, of seeing know, it, but we both feel like we have an advantage. And let me tell you something about fishing. If it's in your head, it's in your, it's head. In your head, and it matters. The other thing that I would I would like to add that I that I also think is important on having a little bit of give in your rod is you get a lot more bites than you realize. I, I fish the crankbait so much that I can feel these fish hit it, and I think my customers probably are getting hits at times. Um, maybe don't feel them. I can feel fish hit that that bait a lot of times. A lot of times when you're getting these outside or like jerk bait, you're getting slappers, you get them on the yeah. outside of the face. I, they do that thing that with a crankbait a lot. That's, 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 why it's in, it, yeah. that's why it's in my head as well. Yep. Oh man, absolutely. You know, one, one thing I'll say is Kevin Van Dam is one of the best crankbait fishermen that's ever lived and so is Rick Klein and they throw complete Complete different <laughs> there setups. There you go. I mean, That's a Rick, really good example. Rick King Clun throws a dang on heavy action rod on everything with treble hooks. It's the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. But he does.
and he did, he's done pretty well with it. Yeah, I would say Rick Conn's done pretty well for yeah. himself, for sure. Hey, we didn't really do any questions, but we're happy to answer any questions you guys might have on anything. So, anybody got any? Y'all got to have at least a couple. But if we just rattled off that much, yes, sir. I'm just gonna ask you about netting the fish. What you got? <laughs> uh, three weeks what do you? Ago, what's a net? Me and my, my grandson was up there fishing, and we were fishing. I guess a hawk moved around, I don't know, because he had one over eight, and I could not land it for him. Yeah, I couldn't get it in the net. He should be caught before or what? But he was coming right to it, right to the net. Already had it in the water. Went this way, and then he come back. I just go right in it, speared off, popped his line, and everything. Just broke the line. Is there any tricks or anything? So let me repeat the question so the people watching. He's asking what is basically. I think what you're trying to ask is what's the proper technique for for landing a fish with a net, and um, his grandson lost a big one. He couldn't get it right. in the net. But now I, I will tell you, you probably could have asked two worse people. Because, because we will use a net less like, well, for us, when we're fishing, we don't really net much. But the problem with the net is... But we, I use it for customers. you use it for customers? Oh, yeah, yeah. I use if it for it's customers. a big one, I'll use it. Yeah. But the problem with the net is we rush fish on a net. Yes. We're not taking our time. They're not warm. If that fish is green, she's got all her energy. Yeah. You got to let her run a little bit, you know. Uh, we, we Especially these big fish, they get up to the boat and they're green. Ooh, and you start yeah. trying to net them, man, that's oh, when... Wow. Everything goes down. You better have the right rod and set up to be able to control that fish. Yeah, if you, and you better have rain. a long net with yeah. a big old basket. Yeah. You know? I like a challenge. I use like a crappie net. No, it probably would have been better. <laughs> <laughs> it probably would have been better just to. Better yeah, to play it out a little bit. Yeah, play her out a little bit. Don't get her to the boat so hot. And then, you know, I, I think kind of maybe what you're asking is there's, there's two schools of thought that I've heard some people talk about sometimes is some people want to put the net in the water and let the guy bring the fish to the net. And then other people want to let the fish come to the boat and scoop the fish. Mm. And Makes me nervous. Yeah, I mean, it's listen, anytime you got a big fish beside the boat, it's all nervous. 100% what Ronnie's saying is true. If you have the opportunity to play the fish, play the fish. Yeah. Let the fish get tired before it gets to the boat if you get that chance. Um, for me, I understand what you're saying. If you have the net in the water, there are plenty of times when that fish is just kind of coming along, then all of a sudden it's like it sees that net and gets this crazy burst of energy. Uh, I've seen that happen a lot and so for me now I wouldn't want anybody else doing this to my fish like I don't want Bobby over here stabbing the net at my fish I don't like I would much rather Bobby put the net in the water but I'm on the water every day and with customers I've netted a ton of fish over the years and I'm overly confident in my hand-eye coordination athletic abilities because that's I'm just cocky like that <laughs> so <laughs> that's me playing on the dang ping pong team at an all-girls catholic school now he's basically yeah. <laughs> Amy Smith ping pong takes a lot of hand-eye coordination so that's, that's, that's true anyways I, all jokes aside I've netted a lot of fish um and so I like to keep the net out of the water myself for my customers I'll keep the net kind of up there on the gunnel right above the gunnel just hovering and when the, if the fish is coming by, when I feel like I can make a stab at it, I'll throw that net right for that fish and then turn it under him and scoop him. That being said, there's plenty of times when that fish starts to make that run, and if it starts to kind of turn away from the boat or turn down, I'll hold off and say, nope, nope, nope. You know, she's not ready yet. So I'm kind of, because I'm the, usually, I'm the most experienced one in the boat, I'm leaving it up to me to make the decision on when that fish is ready to net. Um, I think it's safer to put the net in the water and bring the fish to the net, but you better make sure the person on the other end understands that if that fish runs, he better let him run. You know, if that fish turns away and dogs him, he better not try to force him back, or you can lose a lot of fish when you try to, if you try to manhandle that fish when it turns away, that's where you lose them. Like if I'm fishing a tournament with somebody that I haven't fished with a bunch, and I get one on, I'll be like, just put the net in the water, and I'm gonna put the fish in the net. If I'm with the customer or anybody else, I'm, same thing, I'm scooping, I'm scooping that fish. Yeah, but uh, like he said, when I when I need to back up, whoa. Yeah, sometimes you gotta let that fish make another lap. Get it? Yeah. Sometimes I just let them jump out of the net. You I did? did do that. Yeah. You, you, there was it your yeah. nephew? Yeah. yeah. Had like a nine pounder or something. He's terrible at fishing, and then he finally got a big one. Yeah. And uh, you scooped it, and the fish it jumped, jumped out of the net. But that's because you use that dang crappy net. Well, it makes it more challenging. It does. <laughs> It also makes them jump out and lose them. It, the, the, what it does show is he hung it on a, it's like a nine or ten pounder, and he hung, which I'm really happy it got off. Because, <laughs> because let me tell you, all my goal was for the day was to catch a big one on a buzz bait, and I got two big ones, and then he hung that one. 
And it, it was, was bigger, bigger than either of the other really? two I caught. <laughs> yeah, it figured you But yeah, it got wrapped in the bush. Can't be letting nephew out, out fish you on the big fish deal. No, man. That ain't no good. he did that day. He caught that eight and a half. Yeah. Hey, any more questions? Yes, sir. Do you want a lot of wind on these points you mentioned? There's no wind. For the deep offshore deal? Yeah. So what he asked was, do we want a lot of wind on our offshore structure on the points and stuff? <laughs> I don't want that much wind. If, so if, if I'm fishing, if I'm fishing up shallow, I want wind. If I'm fishing out deep, I don't really. I want a little bit of wind always, but I don't care. <laughs> no, Dude, today, they, today you can really can't fish a lot of that stuff. They can't see. Yeah. I mean, you know, if they're 20, 30 foot of water, they don't. They can't see the wind. It's not affecting them. Either. I do think that I, I've seen both. I, I hate saying that this is the best or that's the best, but I've had days out here where there's there's not a lick of wind. I mean, it's zero, and you can't get your bait to the bottom. And I've had days when it's like that that they will not bite. I mean, they will not bite. And then you get a little breeze and they start fire up. I think the general consistency is moving water is better than still water. 100%. But when you're fishing offshore, when you're fishing deeper water, we don't want it blowing real hard because you're out there in the middle of the lake. And if it gets to blowing too hard, it, you know, can you still get bites in that? Yeah, you, the fish are still doing their thing down there a lot of times. But, man, you can't fish. Like, you can't feel your jig now. <coughs> you know what I mean? You can't control your crankbait and feel your crank. Like, you can't fish as effectively, so you're not as good, and you end up not catching them as good most of the time. You when want the wind to keep your spot lock straight. Through. That's right. Starts, like, yeah, if you don't have any, top. if it's flat calm, your your spot lock loses its mind. So, any other questions? No. All right, man. Well, hey, thank you guys. It, it doesn't look like as big a crowd because we're all spread out, but I think this would have pretty well filled that that upper room up more or less. So. We really appreciate you guys coming back. I know it's been an awkward situation in the world these days, and uh, we t we had to take a break for a few weeks on gathering like this. And uh, man, I'm really happy to see all you guys showing up here. So thank y'all very much. It means a lot. Uh, it, it definitely motivates us to keep digging and keep trying to help you guys. Uh, seeing y'all come out here like this. So thank y'all. Thank all of y'all that watched uh, watched online, and thank most importantly Lake Fork Marina for always allowing us to to host and take care of us and set us up the right way. So we want to thank y'all, man. Hey, we'll, we'll do this again in two weeks and uh, on Friday night at 6 o'clock. Thank y'all.